I just want to warn you, I'm a, I'm a historian of, of zones of human catastrophe. I'm, I'm basically a professional disaster tourist. And so to come here on a Sunday morning uh, is an extra act of courage on your part. Um, and I wrote this book. This is the third book I've written. And uh, I wrote it um, to talk really about my misadventures as I've been a historian of disaster and disaster zones. And um, as I was putting my notes together for this talk, I, I, really, I understood I'm, I'm really a product of my times. Um, that uh, This most re recent book I've written, Dispatches from Dystopia, um, is in the mode of a reality TV show. Um, and here's Honey Boo Boo and her family. And here's the Guardian saying, you know, it's, you know, snobbery aside, there's something to it. And um, I realize it's not a very admirable acknowledgement to make that you're, th you're thinking along the lines of reality TV shows as you write your, you know, the hist history by a professional historian. But we live in an era of self-reflection and, and self-referencing. And I think I've gamely followed that trend in writing my histories. Um, when I was thinking about what does this reality TV phenomenon mean, and I think it means that in our age that the fa our faith in the expert, uh, you know, in the in the scientist or the specialist, has been replaced with a a thirst by ordinary people to understand the world around them, and uh, as they reflect on. Um, the mistakes we've made and, and try to overcome them. And um, I think that means that viewers aren't looking for, you know, the talking head and the CNN program that's got all the answers for you prepackaged and refined, but, but, but really for people more like Honey Boo Boo and their family or the Kardashians and people who, who fumble along and shout and scream and make mistakes and then try to correct them. That we're interested more in process than in the complete answers. And so um, that's kind of what this book is about. It's, it's about being there, about um, how places help tell the stories, the, the histories that I write, and how I am there when I'm going to get that story, about me being there in the text. Um, because often when I've been writing about places that have been destroyed or silenced or contaminated. The real problem I have when I get to these places is that, you know, historians work with archives. They go to an archive and they, they work in them and they get the story. But what if the place has been destroyed? What if there is nothing left? Uh, this is a village in um, between Ukraine and Poland. I wrote my first book, A Biography of No Place, about this territory. In this village, a beautiful village on the Pripyat marshes, Europe's largest swamp, no longer exists. Uh, the Soviet, Soviets came in in 1936 and deported everybody who was labeled a Pole out of that village. And then the Germans came in in 1943 and burned it to the ground because they were suspected of being partisans in the conflict in World War II. So when I show up, there's nothing there. So how do I get this story? Um, there's no archives left. These are the kinds of problems I've encountered. So I've taken to using the place itself and an environmental history, really, as a way to try to decode and, and, and figure out what happened. Um, I came across in the 1990s, I was living in Seattle, a basement. And, and there's a chapter about this in this book I've just written. And in this basement were all these possessions of Japanese Americans who had left they could only take two, in 1942, they could only take two suitcases with them when they went to the internment camps. And all the rest of their possessions, they had to get rid of. And so they left, many people in Seattle left their possessions in the basement of the Panama Hotel in what had been Japantown of Seattle. And in 1997, when I found that basement, most of their things were still sitting there. Zoot suits from the 1940s next to silk kimonos from Japan. And I used that basement to try to figure out what it was like to expunge from a city a good portion of its residents and, and what that meant. Um, so that's what I mean by using the place as an archive. In many ways, this basement in Seattle, the Panama Hotel, is a, is a reverse archive. It's, an, it's things that were not intended to be remembered, but were accidentally left there. Um, so these are the kinds of problems I've come across um, as I've worked. And as I've written about them, I've tried to show how, um, in the process of doing 
writing the histories I do, I come about telling these stories in very idiosyncratic ways, very particular ways that have to do with how I, not somebody else, got the story. And so, um, like reality TV, I, I like to take my readers along on my quest um, so they can see how I got the story and the mistakes I made and, and how I tried to figure out how to correct them. So as a consequence, I wrote my dissertation and subsequent books in the first person. And um, if you know anything about professional history, writing in the first person is a big no-no. Uh, for, for academics in general, we're not supposed to do that. I mean, the third person conveys detachment and objectivity. Uh, it gives the impression that the author is soaring somewhere up there with the birds and can see everything, right? You've all had that experience of seeing everything and knowing everything. <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? And so um, the third person, is, I think, is so sacred among scholars because it, it gives legitimacy to the author's authority. But I kind of think it's a false legitimacy. So using the first person is maybe unpopular in certain academic circles because I'm pointing to that problem, that big gaping problem of here we have these disciplines where we purport to tell the truth, like history, but we have this big lie in the center of our narrative mode. We're by writing exclusively in the third person. We're, we're pretending we're not there when we're getting the story. Where, where, who is this narrator? Where did this person come from? Um, so what happens when I admit I'm there? I'm, I'm there in the story like a, a stage actor facing the imaginary fourth wall. You know, I, I, I address the audience. I, I break out and address the audience. What's wrong with that? Um, I asked, but you know, I asked editors who said you can't do this. I asked my professors when I was in grad school who said you can't do this, and I said, why can't I write in the first person? They say, well, it's just not done. <laughs> but that's no answer. Um, so I think it, you know, even worse than writing in the first person, I concede to having feelings about the people I write about and about the this history of the events I'm telling. When uh, scholars are supposed to be neutral and detached. Um, so I, I started on dispatches um, to explain why I, I continue to commit these major violations of a silent pact among historians to pretend we're not there and to pretend we have no feelings about the histories that we write or no you know, personal biographies that inform our understanding of the past. So this book is, is really about two forms of being there. First, being there in the place, and second, being there in the text, and about how problematic both those two ventures can be. So I wanna take you to a couple of places in this talk, and the first place is the Chernobyl zone of alienation. In, in 1986, uh, a nuclear power plant in northern Ukraine blew up, and it spread between 90 and 150 million curies of radiation into the surrounding atmosphere, and they um, circled a 30-kilometer zone around the plant, place and, and evacuated everybody from it. For a long time, nobody was really, other than people who worked there, were allowed to enter it. And um, 2004, after I wrote this first book about Ukraine, a lot of people sent me this website of this certain Elena. And um, Elena had this blog in which she had a motorcycle, a, a green Kawasaki, and she had a green leather biking jacket, and she had a pass to the zone of alienation because she said her father had been a physicist at the plant and he had get, gotten her this pass to go into the zone whenever she wanted. And she would go in whenever she felt like it and ride her motorcycle all around and take pictures of what she saw. And she had these amazing pictures on her website of um, there's the helicopters that flew over and tried to put out the fire, that, that's the helicopter graveyard. And down there is the red forest that was extremely radioactive. And um, I was just really taken with this, this website of Elena's. There was this very famous Russian film by this guy named Tarkovsky called The Stalker. Um, now there's a very famous uh, video game called The Stalker. <laughs> and in the film, in Tarkovsky's film, there was an abandoned zone. He made this film in 1978, by the way. You know, good eight years before the accident. There's an abandoned zone, and, and there's something mysterious and invisible in the zone that threatens to kill the people who enter it. And the stalker is um, 
you know, takes money from people who want to go into the zone and get to this one secret room. And, um, and you know, then they go through scenes like this in the film, and, and they want to get to this one secret room, and if, if you enter the, that room, supposedly you would get all your most secret desires granted to you. And in the film, they, it's terrifying, and they finally get there, and there's all these mutant, you know, mysterious forces, and the, 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 the visitors to the zone, they, they can't get up the courage to, to cross the threshold and actually go into the room, and, and the film ends with that. Um, but I was, you know, once I saw Elena's website, I was really, I had my wish, you know, I, I wanted to find these apartments that Elena showed in her photographs that were strewn with people's, you know, artifacts, their diaries and their letters, um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to read those, you know, their old photographs. I wanted to read those because it happened in 1986, and five years later, the Soviet Union fell apart. And I wanted to know, did they have an inkling that their empire was about to collapse? That was my research question. I didn't care about radiation. I didn't care about the accident. So I quickly started making plans to go to the zone. And um, let's see, here I am. The stupid tourist in front of the sarcophagus. You know, that's the, the bombed reactor. And um, as soon as I got there, my guy, this woman by the name of Rima, and she's the woman there in the white coat, she goes, well, you know, Elena's website is a fake. There's, there's nothing true about it at all. Elena evidently had taken, you know, coffee table photograph books of the accident, scanned them in, and then got her, you know, took her pictures of herself in the Ukrainian countryside with her green, you know, leather biking jacket and her motorcycle. And, and then later, she became this top Yahoo, top hitting um, website, millions of viewers for a couple of months. And then when she became so famous, she actually said, I better go to the zone. And she signed up for a three hour tour and Rima was her guide. And Rima said, you know, why do you have that motorcycle helmet along with you. Do you think that's going to help you with the radiation? And uh, she said, oh, my husband just has a fetish of taking pictures of me with my helmet on. So she fakes the whole thing, you know, even afterwards. And, and it was, you know, there's, you can go to the chat room related to the site. And the chat room was pretty interesting because there was all these mostly men around the Anglophone world who were really taken with this hot babe uh, on a hot bike in a hot zone. And, um, <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, what was I to do? I had come all this way, lured by a, a fake website. And once I learned it was a fake, I was like, I mean, come on, I'm a professional researcher. How did I get taken in? I, I go back to Elena's website, and it's clearly a fake. I mean, how did she get all those aerial shots? <laughs> did she have wings on her motorcycle? You know, what was I thinking? And then I was, I was wondering about it. Like, why was I so seduced by this website? And I think there were a number of things about it. You know, she, her voice was so confident and, and so um, complete, you know, her, her narrator's voice. You know, she knew who she was, she knew what she saw, she, knew, she saw the damage to her native land, and she named it. Um, in many ways, she created a, an authorial voice that I longed to reproduce. Her voice was commanding, present, yet intimate in that way that blogs can be. Um, and the other thing about it, I think, is that um, she was alone, right? She had this pass, and she had this motorcycle, and she was free to go wherever she wanted in the zone. Um, and there I was, you know, I, I was accompanied by this guide, and, um, you know, the, I always had to have this guide with a pass with me, and, and I also was always accompanied by my fear. And, Elena's felt so fearless and intrepid, and um, that really was also seductive for me. So as I thought about, you know, Elena, after, after she, um, after people started accusing her of faking her website, um, she became Elena in quotation marks, which I thought was a pretty interesting <laughs> move to make, right? And I started thinking more about her voice and her, and her narrative mode and what so seduced me about it, and I read this, um, philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin, who, who lived not far from Chernobyl in Vitebsk, which is up there in Belarus, and Vitebsk got hit pretty bad by uh, clouds of radiation. But 
Bakhtin was there in the 1920s, and they were carrying out this big artistic experiment. Um, Bakhtin lived in this little town of Vitebsk, which was an East European sh you know, shtetl, where it was a trilingual city. People spoke in Yiddish and Polish and Belarusian. And um, Chagall was in Vitebsk when Bakhtin was there and painted, this is Vitebsk down below, and painted these magical um, paintings and mosaics that we know well here in Chicago. And the other guy that was there was Malevich. And Malevich uh, paints you know, these abstract squares and circles and sticks going through them. And so in this town of Vitebsk, when Bakhtin was living there, um, but, uh, Chagall students would paint buildings to make money. They would paint residence buildings. And they, Chagall students would paint in the Chagall style like this. And Malevich students would paint in the Malevich style with the squares and the circles. And so it was this sort of magical place, and Bakhtin was writing from there, and he, and he was writing about narratives and voices. He was sort of a literary critic, and he talked about polyphonic communication, multi-voiced communications, and how do you write a polyphon in a polyphonic way, where what he thought of was that um, you could mingle language groups and culture and classes in a way that would protect against the assertion of what he called the single language of truth. And in contrast to polyphonic language, he talked about monologic language. And that was just a single voice um, that cut short dialogue, attempted to fix truth, and exclude other voices and deny conflicting arguments. And I think in many ways that Bakhtin might have called Elena's voice monologic, which was what I found so seductive about it. She knew what she was saying. And there were, even though she made it up, her truth seemed so real. Um, so as I was thinking about it, I started to think more about the narrative modes I use. And I think most often, because I'm this you know, middle-class American who goes to places that have been damaged and destroyed, I often write in, in what you'd call a confessional mode, because I feel guilty before these people who I'm writing, I'm writing about, and their lives have been damaged or destroyed, and I'm witnessing it, and I'm kind of a voyeur that way. Um, other times I, I write in the mode of an unreliable narrator, because I'm, I'm actively trying to question the kind of assertions we make in scholarship. But I thought for this chapter in this book, I would make up a new narrative, narrative mode, and, and I would name it. And that narrative mode is that of the coward. <laughs> and um, because, you know, since I was in the zone, I decided to make the best of it. And so one morning I got up. I was there for about a week. And you stay when you're in the Chernobyl zone in a double-wide trailer. That, that's the hotel, and, they, and they've moved it in. And it's supposed to be pretty clean space. And you stay there, and the, the, and the breakfast, you know, cafe, cafeteria, they, the, the menu says radiation-free food served to you. And, um, but I got up early one morning before Rima came, and I was wandering around this town of Chernobyl, which was an old East European shtetl. And I, there was this green wall by the riverbank, and it just looked like vines and trees. But I looked more closely, and I could see some houses back there that had been grown over by, the, by this understory. And I crawled through, and I got to this cottage. And I got right to the to the door of the cottage, and I could see inside all the stuff I had been looking for. Because Rima had been showing me all these apartments that had been picked clean, but this old shtetl cottage had you know, some notebooks on the floor, and old shoes, and clothing, and, and, and dolls, and toys, and things like that. And I was itching to enter, right? Um, but I didn't have my face mask with me to filter out the radioactive dust. I didn't have my Geiger counter along. And then I looked at this old, you know, swaddle and daub, 150-year-old building, and I thought, I walk in and this thing could collapse on me. And then I looked around and there was, the ground was all torn up um, from wild boars. And, you know, they had warned me about the wild boars, and they said, watch out, those, those things will attack you and kill you. And so I got, as much as I wanted to enter that, this cottage, I didn't. I didn't have the courage. Um, this wasn't the kind of research I was used to doing. I was sitting there. I was used to going to archives and obliging archivists, hand you the documents. It's warm. It's heated. You're safe. <laughs> and here I stood at the threshold of this cottage, afraid to enter it, like those characters in the stalker film. And I was thinking, you know, Elena wouldn't do this. Elena would go straight in there. 
And then I thought, you know, she rode her motorcycle all over the zone. And then I had to remind myself that Elena didn't do that. <laughs> she, like the millions of viewers to her website, were all sitting safely at home in front of their computers. And I was the only one duped into this misadventure. And so I, I didn't go in and I, I sort of reeled away and I went back to the, you know, where it's the relative safety of the center of, of the town of Chernobyl. And right in the main square, I come up against this wild horse. You know, there's Lenin, center of the town, Lenin. And then there's this wild horse and he had this big sort of antediluvian jaw and he was chewing away. And, and that made me nervous too. And so I, I, I sped back to my double wide hotel and my radiation free breakfast, feeling pretty defeated. Um, and later that week, uh, Rima, my guide, sort of served as a, as a debunker, debunking the, the myths that Elena had created on her website. And uh, she showed me, for instance, you know, we climbed up this uh, abandoned apartment building, a 20-story apartment building in, the, in the, the nuclear city of Pripyat, and there was this clothesline with clothes on it. And she said, you know, Elena hung those clothes up, and then she wrote in her website, this family didn't even have time to take their laundry down. Um, and then she had these uh, pictures of the you know, piano with, this is what really got me, this is what hooked me, right? The piano with people's photographs and, and diaries and letters on them. She had gathered them from all the apartments she could find and put them on that one piano, which was too heavy to loot because it was you know, on the 16th floor of this apartment building, the elevator no longer working. And so uh, Rima showed me that. She said, see, Elena put these all here and then took pictures of it. Um, so I realized that you know, once I stepped out of the archive, I, I was on my own, like Elena in the depths of her imagination, to make my way among these many conflicting truths. You know, there are no curators there to verify the date and ownership of objects. There's no archivist to authenticate documents. No one to prevent me from taking something and stashing it in my bag and taking it home. So the very freedom that drew me to the zone to hunt down my own sources left me in limbo with no way to check those sources, no way to verify knowledge. And so the zone for me became a metaphor for the kind of debates that have reverberated over the past few decades about the links between power and, and the production of knowledge and what occurs to truth when we no lo longer know how to authenticate it and verify it. And I, and I think we have this, you know, it's election time and we have all that we watch the Republican debates and we watch the Democratic debates and, and, and there's no truth. The truths are so different, right? And, and I think that we, every time we watch one TV station, you watch Fox News and then you watch PBS, those truths are so different. And I think we're, all, we're grappling with this over and over in our society as we have these voices, all of them monologic, all of them speaking about a one single truth, and we don't know what to do with it. And, and that's what the zone became for me in many ways. It's a disorderly, dangerous terrain um, and that Elena had certainly committed a fraud, but more generally, I realized that in the belly of every truth I seek, there lies a hoax. And, and that's really what I took away from that message. A few years later, um, I went to the, the Russian Urals, and that's where that, they had made a lot of their nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And I was interested in this plutonium plant, um, the Mayak plutonium plant, because it had um, spilled a lot more radiation into the world than Chernobyl. And I wrote a book about it. I wrote a, a book about the Soviet Chernobyl plant, uh, plutonium plant and the American one. And the book, that book's called Plutopia. Um, and when I got there, I was interested in the nuclear security state, um, but I couldn't enter this closed city. They, they built a city for the people who, who made plutonium, and they locked the city up, and no foreigner can enter it. If, you, if any of you can ever get in there, let me know. But I couldn't get in there after 10 years of trying. So I had this kind of like, like in a Cold War spy novel. I, I rented a little cottage just outside of the closed city in a village. I had a contact inside the closed city. And she would call me and say, I've got some people who are willing to talk to you. And then they would come out to my village. And they couldn't, I couldn't interview them in the, in the little cottage I was staying in. But um, I, had could, I had a little office in an in a old folks home. And we would meet there in a neutral third location. Um, and then people would show up. And, um, and you know, here's, you know, this is a whole zone here. You have to be very careful when you're there. And these people would show up. And um, 
they would hear my accent. I, I would speak Russian with an American accent. And they would say, you know, who are you? And I'd say, I'm an American. And, and they had signed these security oaths all their lives that they were not going to give secrets away to American spies. And here's one right in the room with them. And so a lot of people, about half the people who came to talk to me left without talking to me. Uh, and most of the people who left were, were the men. You know, this guy here on the left got up and left. And the women were left talking to me. And the women, it got to be sort of like a, you know, me and four or five women. And um, it, it got to be like a Saturday morning at the sauna in Russia, that's is called the banya. We were, you know, women are sitting around and they're talking at the banya about um, sex and their health and their bodies. And that's what it became. And I was interested in the nuclear security state. That's what <laughs> I was interested in. <laughs> and so um, the women kept telling me about their health problems and describing their illnesses. And they had these papers with them, dog-eared papers that were their medical records, and they'd shove them my way. And I would shove them back. And uh, I would ask questions about the gates and the guards and the surveillance. And, and they would answer me and tell me about their heart and blood and kidneys and livers. And it went back and forth this way. Uh, like, we would tussle. Um, an oral interview is often like a negotiation. Each side has something what they want to get out of it. And, and in these conversations, everybody was frustrated. Nobody was getting out of it what they wanted. Um, and finally, one woman, her name was uh, Anna Kuzminova, uh, realizing she wasn't getting anywhere with me, that I wasn't listening to her. She finally just put the papers away and stood up. And before I could stop her, she unbuttoned her shirt and lifted it up to show me her torso, which had a cross hatch of scars on it, like thick, crawling worms in a four square, almost voiding her torso. And that finally got my attention. Um, I didn't know if the cause from those many surgeries were the isotopes from the plant, but her pain recorded in her bodily etchings was simply exhaustingly there, and I could no longer doubt it, though I wished it would go away. And Kuzminova wanted me to see her body in order to grant her a diagnosis. The diagnosis she wanted was something called chronic radiation syndrome. And she wanted me to recognize that so that she and other w others would feel justified in their claims they were making to the Russian state at the time. And these women ar argued that they lived uh, downstream along this river into which the Russian government, the, Russian, the plant, had dumped three million curies of radioactive waste. And they had lived on this river and they drank from it and bathed in it and fished it and swam in it, the whole thing. Um, now, for many years, the, the Russian doctors many years before, the Russian doctors had created this diagnosis called chronic radiation syndrome, so far only known in the Russian medical lexicon. And it describes long-term, low-dose exposure to radiation that amounts to a general sort of assault on one's body as radiation, radioactive isotopes deposit in multiple organs of the body, causing really a full-body malaise, as they saw it. You know, the, um, the symptoms include chronic fatigue, severe anemia, weight loss, um, diabetes, immune and circulation system disorders, serious disorders of the digestive tract. Basically, a person feels awful long before they get radiation-induced cancers. Now, I didn't know what to do with this. I'm an historian. I'm not a medical specialist. I have no background in science. Nor do they have the power to evaluate and pass judgment on these women's illnesses. The legal authorities and the doctors in the region said these women weren't sick from chronic radiation syndrome. They were, they were just chronic welfare cases looking for a handout, you know. And so who was, you know, I have to say who was right. Um, when I got home, I, I started reading the medical records and the medical studies, and, and the story got even more complicated. Um, medical researchers really dominated this debate, and they did so in the United States and in Russia. And um, this is the American plutonium plant in, in Hanford, Washington. Um, and it was medical researchers who really had the, the, the instruments to measure these invisible and sensible radioactive isotopes. And um, that gave them the power to pronounce judgments on people's health. And the American medical doctors, over the many years, that they had also been exposing people to radiation in Nevada and Washington state. Um, had determined from studies that they had done on J Japanese bomb survivors that 
you only get from radiation a handful of cancers and maybe thyroid disease. And they said that the long list of illnesses that people had on the Tietja River had nothing to do with radiation. So there's this difference, right, between the Russian doctors who say there's chronic radiation syndrome and the American doctors who say no such thing exists. And then something really strange happened in 1991. The Soviet Union collapsed. Everything Soviet was discredited, including Soviet science. And the American medical beliefs really took over uh, as American medical establishments in the Department of Energy started funding Russian research institutions that had anything to do with nuclear issues. So Kuzminova wanted me to restore this diagnosis that had disappeared, this chronic radiation syndrome. Um, and I was wondering, why did the Americans not also recognize chronic radiation syndrome? Lots of people I talked to in eastern Washington had the very same symptoms. A lot of people I talked to in Nevada, same thing again. And I realized that the way the Americans do it is that they, they say there's a threshold for radiation in a body, and below that threshold, a body is safe. So all you need to do, you don't have to look at bodies. You just go look at the environment. You measure if the radiation levels are safe, the people who live there are safe. And so that's what they did. Throughout the Cold War, they went and took lots of measurements. And that's what I found in the, in the record. I didn't see any measurements of bodies. I saw measurements of environment. They went here, they are circling Mount Rainier, and they're, they're taking air filter samples. They sampled the Columbia River, all kinds of things. And they kept saying, not enough radiation, like, in the, like with the atomic bomb blast, these people are safe. And that really struck me, because in the studies that emerged from the American nuclear installations, bodies of patients, and certainly bodies in pain, were wholly invisible. All I saw were long lists of measurements of earthly bodies, but not of human bodies. This is a story in Christopher Sellers describes this phenomenon in American culture as a body blindness. And grasping this body blindness helped illuminate what had long puzzled me as I read through the medical studies of people near these plutonium plants is that the bodies, how they felt, their complaints, what they experienced as pain or illness played no role in these records. They were simply were no bodies. They were just counts of isotopes and an invisible statistical composite body. You know, it takes a lot of work to make things invisible. And the medical studies in the United States in the 1990s and since then have done just that, dematerializing the bodies of people exposed to the world's first plutonium disasters. And perhaps that's not surprising. Elaine Scarry talks about, in her seminal work, Bodies in Pain, talks about how the thing we most know in the world is our own pain. And the thing we most want to deny is the experience of other people's pain, other bodies in pain. And that's exactly what I had done as I had pushed away my interview subjects' medical studies and, and said, I don't want to hear about your medical problems. I want to hear about the security arrangements. I was doing exactly that. I was denying their pain. I wanted nothing more when Kuzminova raised her shirt to show me her scars than to make her body go away. And so for me, these women suggested a, a new frontier of historical inquiry which, in which one seeks to reanimate and recreate historically voided bodies in a way that does not dismiss bodies in pain. For I, I think the landscape most overlooked in, on the panorama of nuclear sacrifice zones is the landscape of the human body. Human bodies are porous, renewing, and transforming as much as a, a repository, a dump of man-made radioactive waste as our rivers and groundwaters and soil and plants and animals. So when you think of the tourists, the people like myself who engage in dark tourism, and here I am nervously trying to avoid a homemade meal <laughs> along that Tietja River, and the boy behind me um, is our Luchivik, our, our radiant one in the family, as they call him. He's had a vocabulary of about 60 words and all kinds of health problems. Um, for those of us who explore ghost towns and, and depopulated nuclear zones, I, I think the last stop on this disaster tour should be a reflective stop, a tour of human bodies 
for they're the long haul truckers of the vast transformations of human history. Human history, in other words, is changing the human body. And as historians, we've really yet breached this historical, this bodily archive, um, even though in the search for nuclear secrets, the bodies have been with us all along. Um, I want to take you to one last stop on this tour. Um, and it's a place not very far from here, uh, in the industrial Midwest. Um, you probably have already realized this, but it took me a long time to realize that um, I had a pattern to the histories I wrote, and that is I tended to seek out modernist wastelands uh, as the subjects of the stories I wrote. And I thought, why, why is that? Is this just a dispassionate interest? Uh, it certainly didn't relate to my own biography. I, I was born uh, into the professional middle class in the industrial heartland of the United States at a time when the United States was the most wealthy and powerful country in the world. Um, I could hardly have been born farther from the rural, famished, war-torn, and contaminated places I write about, mostly in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. But then again, as I thought about it, I was born in one era of historic prosperity and came, in age, came of age in another era of industrial decline. Um, in 1965, my parents settled their growing family in Elgin, Illinois, about 35 miles from here. Um, the major employee in Elgin was the Elgin Watch Company. Um, and everything was fine until 1958, when the company started to record losses. In 1965, the factory was shuttered, and the CFO embezzled the pension plan for the town, so it left a lot of people destitute. And they also left behind a, a stinking river and uh, the shells of emptied factories and former patients of the Elgin uh, State Mental Assignment who were released to the care of their medical therapies in the 1970s. And my mother had left a, a Pennsylvania steel town, um, and then with my father, they, they both fled Detroit in the early 60s. And, they brought with them to Elgin heavy oak furniture, bought cheap in the yard sales of wealthy Detroit residents, you know, leaving their Victorian mansions to go to the suburbs. In my time, my grandmother joined us from the Pennsylvania steel town, and the displaced furniture and, and, and inhabitants were all refugees from a spreading disaster crammed into a 1920s craftsman bungalow, you know, a house a little too small for the burden. And by the time I was conserved, the American manufacturing empire was well on its way to mortification across the inland Midwest and across the northern, uh, I, I teach in Baltimore, it's a picture of deindustrialization. So in 1965, the year I was born, the watch factory shuttered and the time froze, just when it started for me, on the watchtower. So I came of age thinking of that liquidation sales were normal, and so too public demolitions and emptied storefronts and unemployed breadwinners. And it took me a long time to realize that the simmering slow violence to a community, which I witnessed as a child, rematerialized as an adult in a desire to understand it. So as I, when I grew up and became a historian, I went to places that were, were Forces of destruction were so outsized that they were impossible to miss. Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Gulag territories, and nuclear wastelands. This is a, a Gulag tower in the Kazakh steppe. So does that mean I ostensibly was writing histories while I was really writing my own biography? Just constructing an allegory of my own past? I hope not. Rather, I think because places are so closely connected to biography and identity, I believe I was able to see stories that other historians missed because of the sensitivities I acquired as a child. From my childhood in Elgin, I've been drawn to empty buildings to figure out what they revealed about the people who parted with them. It was these people, the last to turn out the lights, um, that most interested me, perhaps because they helped tell a part of my own story, but also because I felt their stories had been overlooked, left invisible, despite their importance. Place is inevitably at the center of these histories because it alone remains to tell the tale. Thank you.
I guess we, we can take questions if there are any. Uh, just a quick question. I was surprised that people actually came in and looted at, uh, at Chernobyl. I would think that that would have just been off limits and so forth. Can you fill in the gaps a little bit when that occurred and so on? Uh, so if you know you can, there's a great uh, website now about uh, Fukushima, and you can go you can go virtually tour the towns that are abandoned around the Fukushima plant, and the stores are stocked there, and you know whole department stores with clothes and food and everything. But this happened, the Chernobyl accident happened just as there was an economic nightmare going on in the Soviet Union, where the people lost their jobs, they had not enough to eat, uh, not enough to to clothe their families, and so people went in and looted whatever they could and sold it. Right away. Pardon me? Right after the disaster? Uh, it, it started to really gain ground in 88, 89, and then and, uh, as control of the zone, sort of, you could bribe a guard, get in, like that. I, you know, they, they, they buried all these radioactive cars. People dug them up and sold them. Yeah, scrap metal. And that stuff will radiate for, you know, 24,000 years if it's got plutonium in it. When you were in Chernobyl, why did you believe Rima? Oh, that's a great question. Why did I believe Rima? <laughs> well, there are other people around who are also saying the same thing. And then I, when I went back to look at Elena's website, it was so fake. I mean, there were so many things that, I mean, one you know, quick week in the Chernobyl zone, you know, she said that the roads were wide open. You could just zoom across them in your motorcycle. No better place in the world to ride your motorbike because there's no traffic. But the roads were terrible. They had been neglected for 30, 25 years at the point, so they were you know, bumpy and trees were growing up through them. And so it, it, it was quickly apparent after a couple of days there that Elena's website was a fake. But Elena not telling the truth doesn't mean Rima was. <laughs> no, that's true, that's true. Um, I'm gullible, you know. <laughs> I really am, I mean, I, I you know. Um, she said that, the, you know, Elena hung those clothes on the line. I, I did believe her. I didn't, I didn't cross-check that. That's a good point. So uh, I've been to Elgin. I can tell you it has a magnificent library. Yes. And there is at least one sports bar that I would recommend. So, <laughs> you know, your, your comments about Elgin are kind of, uh, uh, well, they're not very complimentary. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering... If, that these still would apply today. It's a different time. You know, Elgin, it is a different time, and Elgin's on its way back. It's not 1975 anymore. Um, and, I, you know, I think, I mean, we have the director of the Elgin Historical Society here, who's my sister. <laughs> and she would, she's very happy you, you pointed this out. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, Elgin's been struggling to, to come back like many communities, right, and sort of in, the, in this delicate balance between, you know, we'll get the riverboat casino and that'll bring in tax revenue and we'll get this and we'll get, you know, and it, I don't know, um, and, and my sister Elizabeth Marston has been working hard to build up the historical society so that people have fond memories of Elgin, not deindustrialized memories, but memories of it when it was a thriving community and when the watch factory was ticking away. Um, and that's, um, that's a conflict we have. That's a, that's a family feud we have. Hi, thank you. I, I suspect that, that uh, your book on Plutopia um, could have been only about the Urals, um, but you extended it and made your um, work comparative. And, and I'm just kind of curious uh, about kind of the advantages and disadvantages of extending kind of your, your earlier research in that scope. So you're, so you're asking about my book, Plutopia, uh, which is it's a tandem history of the first two cities in the world to produce plutonium. And they both produce these plutonium disasters that each spilled about 350 million curies of radiation um, and, and left these shadows of people uh, feeling unwell. And um, why did I decide to tell these stories together? I'm trained as a Soviet historian. I probably should have just stayed in the Soviet, right, period. Um, but what I found was that when I went to the Urals, they would say things like, you know, we used to say that when we're in, the, when we're in our Russian plutonium city, if we dug, uh, a, a, dug a tunnel straight through the earth, we'd end up in Richland, Washington, which is where they made plutonium in the United States. And I saw these two places as on an axis, one axis, you know, spinning around each other, around the globe. Every time they built more, you know, they built the American reactors first, 
the Soviets had to respond to build what they called the nuclear shield. They built more reactors in Richland. They had to build more reactors in Azure. So these two towns were in a dialogue with one another. So I'm not comparing them. I'm talking about the communication that they had between them in 40 years of Cold War arms race. And they end up looking a lot alike. There's a great deal of dystopian literature. I'm just curious whether at any point you've gone in the direction of thinking about in a in a sort of larger philosophical way um, why we're all interested in this and what function it serves in, in our understanding of ourselves and our world. Yeah, so in, in this Dispatches from Dystopia, the last chapter is, is talking about this like interest in, in ruins, porn is one way of calling it. Um, uh, and I've been wondering about that myself because you go on the web and there's all kinds of people who who like to look at, you know, in kind of a pornography kind of way, look at pictures of, of d destroyed communities and, and abandoned places, or like to go spelunking through them themselves. And, um, and I do think you're quite right that it is somehow related to our dreams of utopia. You know, if you go down the road to Gary, Indiana, you know, Gary had this idea of building this great community for workers, where workers could live comfortably and, and, and live near the factory and have their families and communities and make a living wage. And, um, and now when you go to Gary, Indiana, it's, it's wrecked. And it's, so it's gone from this, this flip from utopia to dystopia. Uh, it can be so quick and so shocking. And I think that's what fascinates us. And I, and I think one other reason why we're fascinated with this sort of ruins porn is that the pace of abandonment has gone faster and faster and faster, so that more and more places, you know, it used to be it took 100 years to decide a community was worth abandoning, and now you can build a big box store and 20 years later there's, you know, for rent signs out front. Um, in China, they're building whole cities that they're abandoned before they're ever inhabited. Have you notice that? They have huge high-rise cities that are in ruins now because, because of the bubble they never got um, so that pace, I think, of abandonment is, is shocking. And I think we're trying to figure out why we do that as we're in this ecological crisis. In your research, have you ever written suggestions for how people can go about uncovering the history of the place when there's not much besides just getting at, at weeds? Yeah. That, that's, please read my book. That's what it's all about. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> That's why I wrote it, is because I found this same problem. You know, I wanted to write about people who didn't leave in a store of documentary trace, so how do you get at it? And um, you can use oral histories, and you can use literature, and you can use the landscape itself. Um, you know, an old cemetery, the, the remnants of a building, archaeological traces. You, there's all kinds of ways to get, rather than throw up your arms and say, I don't, we, we don't know what the everyday life of these people are. I think there's ways we can um, more fully expand what it means to be an historian. Um, reaching into the disciplines of geographers and anthropologists and archaeologists um, and ethnographers to try to get that story. So you mentioned you wanted to go to Chernobyl because um, you wanted to see those documents and see how they felt in 86 about the events that happened a few years later. If you speak very good Russian, why didn't you just interview <laughs> the people in Russia versus went for the documents in a fairly small town that I don't think would have been largely as much affected by the changes anyway. Oh, well. So why did you go for the papers versus for human interviews? That's related to the last question, is that when you talk to people about events that happened, this is 2004, 20 years in the past, they'll tell you things, and they're, and they're often very interesting, but they won't be like what they were thinking. They're not, they can't recall what they were thinking 20 years before. Right? You know, it's impossible. In fact, we, some people who, who think a lot about oral history think that um, people's memories are about as reliable and related to, the, to the, the events that occurred in the past as are our dreams. So it, it's a way of getting, so that's why it's like related to the last question. It's a, you know, you've got to go to all these different sources and try to figure out. And, I, and, and, I, and I'm telling you, it was a bad idea. Right. I, I wasn't trying to say this is a brilliant idea, it was a stupid idea. Because you're right, I would go there and I would just have this one small town, a very particular you know, nuclear town's version of what 1986 looked like. But I was looking for a snapshot, I was looking for a time capsule. And so it was, I was seduced by it. 
And historians are often seduced by they, they want to find the, the archival cache that nobody else has ever had, right? You know, and that was what I was looking for. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very much.